Chapter thirty five of De Lorme by G. P. R. James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirty five. The memory of what we have done without the aid of vanity would be little better, I believe, than a congregation of regrets. Even in the immediate review of, of a conversation just passed, how many things do we find which we have forgotten to say, or which might have been said better, or ought not to have been said at all? After M. de Retz was gone, I looked back over the half-hour he had spent with me, and instantly remembered a thousand questions which I ought to have asked him, and a thousand things on which I had better have been silent. I felt foolish, too, on remembering that I had proposed to draw from him all his purposes, and yet that he had made himself master of the greater part of my history, while I remained as ignorant of the real object of his visit as if he had never come at all. My resolution, however, was taken to follow his advice in the matter of going to Sudan. My reasons for so doing, or rather my motives, for reasons nine times out of ten, are out of the question in man's actions, were manifold. I despaired of finding Helen. I was aweary of that great heap of stones called Paris, where I knew no one, and I had upon me one of those fits of impatience, which would have made me run into the very jaws of destruction to cast off the listlessness of existence. My eyes had been fixed upon the table while making these reflections, and on raising them I found Achilles standing opposite to me, looking at my face with much the air of a dog who sees his master eating his dinner, and standing upon his hind legs begs for its share too. I could as plainly read in the twinkling little grey eyes of the ci devant player with a lackadaisical expression of his mouth. Pray let me hear the news, as if it had been written in large letters on his forehead. Achilles, said I, willing to gratify him in the most unpleasant way possible, a thing one often feels inclined to do to another, after having somewhat severely schooled oneself. Achilles, I am going to leave you. "'I beg your pardon, monsieur,' replied he calmly, "'but that is quite impossible. "'You can hardly go anywhere where I will not follow you.' "'But listen,' rejoined I, "'I am about to set off for Sedan. "'I ride post, and you can as much ride post as you can—' "'Ride to the devil,' said Achilles, interrupting me. "'I should not find that very difficult, monsieur. "'But I will ride the devil himself, sooner than part with you again.' so make your noble mind up to be hunted like a stag from paris to sedan unless you let me ride quietly by your side though it required no august skill to foresee that little achilles would prove a great encumbrance on the road yet as i found him so determined on going i did not object and bidding him prepare everything the next morning to set out as soon as i returned from the hotel de retz i went to bed and slept soundly till the dawn at the hour appointed I proceeded to keep my engagement, and on entering the court of the Hôtel de Retz, I found myself suddenly immersed in all the noise and bustle of a great family's household. It put me in mind of the tales which our old maître d'hôtel used to tell of the Château de Lorme, in the days which he remembered, when, as he expressed it, there were always a hundred horses in the stable, and fifty gentlemen in the hall ready to mount at a word of my grandfather's mouth and there was nothing but jingling of spurs, except when there was jingling of glasses, and the glittering of arms in the courtyard was only succeeded by glittering of knives at the table. I was immediately shown to the apartments of the Abbé de Retz, where I found him surrounded by the servants and gentlemen of his own suite, which was numerous and splendid, in exactly the same proportion as his personal appearance was simple and unostentatious. On my arrival he rose and embraced me, and, dismissing his attendants, presented me with two letters addressed to the Count de Soissons, which he requested me to deliver, the one from himself, the other from the Duke of Orléans. "'I need not bid you be careful of them,' said he, as he gave the two packets into my hands. "'Each of them contains as much treason as would make the executioner's axe swing merrily.' This was rather a startling piece of information, and I believe that my face, that unhappy betrayer of secrets, showed in some degree how much heavier the letters appeared to me after I had heard such news of their contents. "'You seem surprised,' said de Retz. 
but you have lived so far from the court that you know not what is going on there i do not suppose that there is one man of rank besides yourself in this great city who has not qualified himself for the bastille or the place de greve do you not know that everything with frenchmen depends upon fashion and let me tell you that treason is now the fashion and that a man that could walk across the court of the palais cardinal with his head steady upon his shoulders would be looked upon by our belle dame as either mean-spirited or underbred and scouted from society accordingly i am afraid that i am within the category replied i for i do not know anything which would make my head tremble there or in any other place oh fear not fear not answered monsieur de retz you will find monsieur le comte de soissons surrounded by persons who will speedily put you in the way of as much treason as is necessary to good breeding but let them not lead you too far our breakfast is by this time served in my private dining-hall he added i will send away the servants and while we satisfy our hunger i will give you so much insight into the characters of the party assembled at sedan as may be necessary to your safety thus saying he led me to a room on the same floor where we found a small table spread with various delicacies and covers laid for three remove that cover said m de retz to one of the servants m de lisieux is so much past his time that i am afraid he will not come and now leave us he added and then as soon as the room was clear the truth is said he i never expected the good bishop of lisieux but i told the servants to place a cover for him because he is a great friend of the cardinal de richelieu and it could not get abroad that i was plotting with a stranger when it is known that i expected the great enemy of all plots in the person of the worthy prelate and he smiled while he told me this piece of art piquing himself more upon such petty cunning than upon all the splendid qualities which his mind really possessed yet such perhaps is man's nature valuing himself upon things that are contemptible and very often affecting himself the same follies he condemns in others i give you nothing but fish you will perceive said m de retz as we sat down this being a meagre day of our church though indeed neither the fasting nor mortification are very great yet i always keep these fish days it is a very reputable method of devotion and gains friends amongst the poissard no insignificant class as we proceeded with our meal he gave me the sketches he had promised of m le duc de bouillon he said i shall say nothing except that being a great man and sovereign in his town of sedan i would advise you to show him all respect and attention without however attaching yourself too strongly to what i may call his party near the person of the count himself you will find m de varicarville a man of taste and sense moderate in his passions firm in his principles and devotedly attached to the interest of his lord a very few days communication with him will show you that this statement is correct and in the meanwhile i will give you a note to him which will lead him to open himself to you more than he would do to a stranger another person you will meet is m de bardouville a man of very good intentions but with so muddy a brain that whatever is placed there good or bad sticks so tenaciously that there is no getting it out he has been converted to a wrong party and does all in his power to hurry m le comte into schemes that would prove his ruin but if his intentions are so good said i were it not worth while to attempt at least to bring him over to better opinions by reason no no answered de retz one makes a very foolish use of reasons when one employs it on those who have none let him alone monsieur de lorme the only man who ever made anything of his head was the man that cut it in marble and then as voiture said he had better have left it alone as the bust was not a bit softer than the original but to proceed take notice of compion one of the chief domestics of monsieur le comte he is a man of great probity and sound judgment one that you may confide in you have now my opinion of the principal persons with whom you will be brought in contact but of course you will form your own and drawing in his eyes he considered me for a moment through the half-closed lids as if he would have read in my face what impression all he had said had made upon me 
I could not help smiling, for I saw that the facility with which he had drawn my history from me the night before had given him no very high idea of my intellectual powers, and I replied, still smiling, "'Of course, Monsieur de Retz, I shall form my own opinion. I always do, of every one I meet with.' He did not well understand the smile, and never contented unless he read all that was passing in the mind of those with whom he spoke. He opened his eyes full, and with a frank laugh asked me what I thought then of himself. I have often remarked that perfect candour sometimes puts the most wily politician to fault, more than any imitation of his own doublings, though I believe there was some degree of pique in my doing so too. If you would know frankly what I think of you, Monsieur de Retz, you must hear what I think of your conduct since we first met, for that is all I can personally judge of. Well, well, replied he, speak of that, and I will confess if you are right. In respect to your coming to me last night, then, replied I, I think you had some motive of which I am not aware. A slight flush passed over his face, and then a smile, and he nodded to me to go on. In regard to the valuable information you have given me to-day, and for which you have my thanks, I think that the cause of your giving it is something like the following. You have some interest in the proceedings of His Highness, the Count de Soissons. None but his own, upon my honour, interrupted de Retz. Granted, replied I, of that I do not pretend to judge, but there are evidently two parties about the prince, one urging him one way, and one another. You, Monsieur de Retz, are attached to one of these parties, and you are very glad of the opportunity of our accidental meeting to bias me in favour of that side to which you yourself adhere, and to throw me, though a person of very little consequence, into the hands of those with whom you yourself cooperate. I doubt not, I added with a smile and a bow, that your opinion is perfectly correct, and that to your party I shall finally adhere if his highness thinks fit to retain me near his person but of course it will be the more gratifying to you to find that i embrace your opinions more from conviction than persuasion i am afraid my politeness had taken somewhat of a triumphant tone upon the strength of my supposed discernment and even before i had done speaking i was aware of my error and felt that i might be making an enemy instead of securing a friend but as i have said he always contrived to disappoint expectation. For a moment he looked mortified, but his face gradually resumed its good humour, and he replied with, I believe, real frankness, Monsieur de Long, you are right, I own that I have undervalued you, and you make me feel it, for that is what your conversation points at. But you must give me back that letter to Monsieur le Comte, I must not mislead him in regard to your character." I gave him back the letter, saying jestingly that I should much like to see the reputation which I had acquired on a first interview, and which was doubtless there written down in full. Nay, nay, replied he, tearing it, that were useless, and perhaps worse, but you shall see what I now write, if you will, and I will write it frankly. He accordingly led the way again to his library, where he wrote a short note to the Count which he handed to me. After a few lines of the ambiguous language in which the politicians of that day were wont to envelop their meaning, but which evidently did not at all refer to me, I found the following. This letter will be delivered to your highness by Count Louis de Bigorre, whom you have expected so long. I met with him by accident, and for a time undervalued him, but I find, upon farther knowledge, that he can see into other people's secrets better than he can conceal his own. Whether he is capable of discretion on the affairs of his friends, your highness will judge, for it does not always follow that a man who gossips of himself will gossip of his neighbours. The same vanity which prompts the one will often prevent the other. I do not believe that I should have been able to maintain the same appearance of good humour under Monsieur de Retz's castigation that he had evinced under mine, had I not observed his eye fix on me as he gave me the paper, and felt certain that while I read, it was scrutinising every change of my countenance, with the microscopic exactness of a naturalist dissecting a worm. I was upon my guard, therefore, and took care that my brow should not exhibit a cloud, even as light as the shadow that skims across a summer landscape. 
a fair return in kind replied i giving him back the letter with as calm a smile as if i had been looking at the portrait of his mistress and i shall be obliged of necessity to let monsieur le comte into all my secrets he will be able to judge when he comes to compare notes with you how much your ingenuity drew from me last night and how much my poor discretion managed to conceal excellent good cried de retz rising and taking me by the hand so you would have me think that you had not told me all my dear count and would thus leave the devil of curiosity and the fiend of mortified vanity to tease me between them during your absence but you are mistaken the only use of knowing men's histories is to know their characters and i have learned more of yours to-day than i did even last night however it is time for you to depart there are the letters he continued after having added a few words to that addressed to the count travel as privately as you can and fare you well before we meet again we shall know enough of each other from other sources to spare us the necessity of studying that hard book the human mind without a key i accordingly took leave of monsieur de retz and in my way home found out the dwelling of a horse-dealer for the purpose of buying two nags for achilles and myself the necessity of travelling as privately as possible having induced me to change my intention of taking the post though in his whole nature and character there is not i believe an honester animal in the world than a horse yet there must be something assuredly in a habitual intercourse with him which is very detrimental to honesty in others for certainly and i believe in all ages it has been so there cannot be conceived a race of more arrant cheats and swindlers than the whole set of jockeys grooms and horse-dealers the very first attempt of the man to whom i at present applied was to sell me an old broken-down hack with a roman nose which at once indicated its antiquity for a fine vigorous young horse as he called it well capable of the road the various ingenious tricks had been put in practice of boring his teeth blistering his pastons etc and his coat shone as much as fine oil could make it but still he stood forth with his original sin of old age rank about him and i begged leave to decline the bargain though the dealer and palfrenier both shrugged their shoulders at my obstinacy and declared upon their conscience there was not such another horse in the stable after several endeavours to cheat me in the same manner which they would not abandon or by habit could not abandon although they saw i was somewhat knowing in the trade i fixed upon a strong roan horse for myself and a light easy-going pad for achilles the question now became the price i was to pay and after the haggling of half an hour the dealer agreed to take forty louis for the two which was about five more than their value he declared however so help him god that he lost by it and only let me have them in hope of my future custom i never intend to buy a horse of you again as long as i live replied i sharply so do not suffer that hope to bias you well well take them said he they would soon eat out the money in corn and so i should lose it anyway this matter being settled i directed them to be brought immediately to my lodging making a bargain beforehand for the necessary saddles and bridles of which the good dealer kept a store at hand and then sped on to see that all was prepared for our departure it was already past midday but everything having been made ready during my absence by the activity of my little attendant as soon as the horses were brought we loaded them with our bags and our persons and set out for sedan be it remarked however that i still maintained my little lodging in the rue des prets saint paul as from some words dropped by the abbe de retz i fancied that i might have occasion to return to paris on the affairs of monsieur le comte the ambling jennet which i had bought for achilles was so much easier than any horse whose back he had ever yet honoured that the poor little man after having anticipated the pains of hell found himself in elysium and declared that he could ride to jerusalem and back without considering it a pilgrimage i was resolved however to put his horsemanship to the proof for though i did not seek to call attention to myself by galloping like an express in that age when even one's horse's pace was matter of suspicion yet as the way was long i calculated that we might at least reach juar that night 
this was accomplished easily stopping but half an hour at mole to feed our horses and then proceeding with all speed we saw la ferte not far off at about an hour before sunset with its beautiful abbey standing out clear and rich against the evening sky and the sweet valley of the morin winding away in the soft obscurity of the declining light turning out of one of the by-roads a horseman overtook us and saluting us civilly joined himself to our party from the hint monsieur de retz had given me concerning the letter of the duke of orleans i thought it best to avoid all communication with strangers and therefore gave but very cold encouragement to our new companion's advances he was a small keen resolute-looking little man and not to be repulsed easily as i soon found for perceiving that i was not inclined to continue the conversation which he had commenced he took the whole burden of it upon himself and with a peculiar talent for hypotheses he raised as many conjectures concerning the point to which our journey ended and our particular object in journeying as would have found employment for at least a hundred if they had all been true i remembered that caesar in some part of his commentaries attributes particularly to the gauls a bad habit of stopping strangers and asking them impertinent questions and i could not help thinking that the valiant roman in some of his adventures must have met with the ancestors of our new companion we jogged on however i maintaining my silence and achilles playing the stranger as i have seen a skilful fisherman play a large trout when the horseman discovered that our nature was not of a very communicative quality he seemed to think that perhaps we required him to open the way and therefore he told us that he was going to la ferte to buy grindstones and that he always lodged at the auberge of the ecu which he begged to recommend to us as the best in town it was the very best he said beyond dispute we should find good beds good victuals and good wine all at a reasonable rate and he farther hinted that if we desired such a thing we might have the advantage of his company to give us an account of the town and point out to us its beauties and curiosities only if we desired it he said he was not a man to force his society upon any one i replied by a bow which i intended to be very conclusive but our new friend was not a man to be satisfied with bows and therefore he asked straightforward whether i intended to go to the ecu i replied that it would depend on circumstances and as we were by this time in the town of la ferte no sooner did i see him draw his rein as if about to proceed to his favourite auberge than i drew mine the contrary way and was galloping off when to my horror and astonishment he turned after me declaring with a smile of patronising kindness that i was so sweet a youth he could not think of parting with me and therefore as i would not come to his auberge he would come to mine the matter was now beyond endurance sir said i pulling in my rein and eyeing him with that cold sort of contemptuous frown which i had generally found a sufficient shield against impertinence be so good as to pursue your own way and allow me to pursue mine i neither require your society nor is it agreeable to me and therefore i wish you good morning ho sir ho replied the stranger i am not a man to force my society upon any one but you cannot prevent my going to the same inn with yourself i read something fortunate in your countenance and therefore i am sure that no accident will happen to me while i am under the same roof with you the inn where you sleep will not be burnt down thieves will not break into it the rafters will not give way and the walls fall in sir i am a physiognomist a chiromancer an astrologer i am no necromancer however i neither evoke spirits nor use magic white or black no no replied achilles grinning till an improper connection seemed likely to take place between his mouth and his ears no no you may be a chiromancer and astrologer but you are no conjurer that is clear enough silence achilles cried i let him pursue his own follies and follow me on thus saying i rode forward resolved rather to climb the hill to jouar than expose myself to encounter any more of the babbling old fool's impertinence but this effort was as vain as the former for determined not to be shaken off he kept close behind me till we had reached the beautiful little town of jouar and were safely lodged in the only auberge which it contained 
the moment after i had entered in he marched into the kitchen and though the landlord treated him as a stranger yet there was a something i know not what which impressed upon my mind that there was some sort of understanding between them odd suspicions crossed my imagination and i resolved to be upon my guard at the same time i knew that too great an appearance of reserve might excite suspicion and consequently i spoke a few quiet words to the landlord such as a somewhat taciturn traveller might be supposed to exchange with his host on his arrival and then went to achilles to see that the horses were properly provided for in regard to the stranger he talked with every one who would talk with him always taking care however to keep me and my fortunate face in sight and indeed he seemed gifted with ubiquity for no sooner did i leave him in the kitchen than i met him in the stable and the next moment i found him again bustling about in the kitchen ordering his supper with a tone of great authority for his part the landlord who acted also as cook and who seemed himself stewed down to nothing from his continual commerce with stewpans showed the stranger a thousand times more submissive respect than to any one else bending his elastic knees with an infinitely lower cringe when the stranger addressed him than when i did as soon as i had supped we retired to our sleeping chamber achilles having his allotted place in a small truckle bed which must have been made for him it fitted so nicely before retiring to rest however i took care to secure the letters of the count de soissons under my bolster fastening the door which had no lock with what was perhaps better a large heavy bolt i slept soundly till the next morning but on waking i found my poor little attendant almost speechless with fear as soon as he could speak however he declared that in the grey of the morning he had seen a ghost glide in he knew not how proceed to the leathern bags which contained our effects and fumble them for a moment or two in a very mysterious manner it then glided out he added just as i woke but with so little noise that it could not have been the cause of dissipating my slumber by heaven it was a dangerous undertaking cried i in a loud voice for the benefit of any one within hearing had i chanced to wake i would have shot it had it been the best ghost that ever was born examine the bags achilles and see if anything has been stolen at the same time i proceeded to ascertain whether the bolt had been drawn back by any contrivance from without but all appeared as i had left it and nothing seemed gone from the bags so that i was obliged to conclude that either achilles's imagination had deceived him or that some one had gained admission into the chamber by means i could not discover for some other purpose than simple robbery after the utmost scrutiny however i could not perceive any possible way of entering the room and dressing myself as quickly as possible i descended in order to pay my reckoning and set out immediately the landlord stated the sum and i laid down the money on the table piece by piece which he took up in the same manner bending his head over it till it was close to mine when suddenly he said in a low whisper seeming to count the silver all the time you are accompanied by a spy if you want to conceal whither you go mount and be gone with all speed and take care of your road i replied nothing but hurried the preparation of the horses as much as possible and was in hopes of escaping before my persecutor of the night made his appearance but just as i had my foot in the stirrup his visage presented itself at the door crying with the most indomptible imprudence wait for me wait for me i will not be a moment as may well be supposed i did not even wait to reply but putting my spurs to my horse i set off down the hill begging achilles to seduce his beast into a gallop if possible the little man did his best and so successful were we in our endeavours that we soon left jouard far behind us and on turning to look back on the road after half an hour's hard riding i could see nothing but a blessed void which gave me more pleasure than anything i could have beheld i slackened not my pace however but rode on towards montmiral as fast as possible thinking over the circumstances which had given rise to my galloping the minister i knew with the jealous suspicion of usurped power maintained a complete regiment of spies scattered all over the kingdom and invested with every different character and appearance which could disguise their real occupation 
and I doubted not that, according to the landlord's hint at Jouar, our talkative companion was one of this respectable troop. The character which he assumed was certainly a singular one, but it must be confessed he played it to admiration, and I congratulated myself not a little on having escaped the pursuit of such a vampire. End of chapter 35《Chapter Thirty Six of De Lorme by G. P. R. James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Thirty Six. As I wished much to arrive at Chalon that night, we remained no longer at Montmirail than was absolutely necessary to refresh the horses. But before we arrived at Chantrix, the ambling knack which had borne Achilles began to appear jaded, and for fear of knocking him up altogether, I determined to halt at that little village for the night, never doubting that we had left our persecutor far behind. What was my surprise, then, on descending to the courtyard the next morning, to see the same identical little man, with his brown pourpoint and his immense funnel-shaped riding-boots, standing in the court ready to mount his horse? I drew back instantly, hoping he had not seen me, but to see everything was a part of his profession, and quitting his horse's bridle, he ran into the house after me, pulled off his beaver with the lowest possible bow, giving me the compliments of the morning, and declaring himself the happiest man in the world to have met with me and my fortunate countenance again. "'I saw your horse standing in the stable,' added he, and was resolved not to be too late to-day. His persevering impudence was so ridiculous that I could not help laughing, and as I saw no way of getting rid of him at the time, I resolved to tolerate him for a while, till I could find some means either of putting him on a wrong scent, or of casting him off more effectually. "'Well, then,' replied I, "'if you are resolved to follow my fortunate face all over the world, you will have to ride fast and far, for I am going to Metz and am pressed for time.' "'Sir,' replied the stranger, "'I am delighted at the opportunity of riding with you so far. If you had ever been in the East, sir, you would have no difficulty in divining my motive in accompanying you. Without having been in the East, I muttered to myself, I have no difficulty in divining your motive. But taking care not to allow him to suppose I entertained any suspicions of him, I begged he would explain how a journey to the East could have enlightened me upon such a subject. Why, you must know, sir, replied he, that all Oriental nations hold, and I profess myself of their opinion, that good and bad fortune are infectious, and that by keeping company with a fortunate man, we very often mend our own luck. Now, sir, I read in your countenance that you were born under a fortunate star, and therefore I resolved not to leave you till I was certain I had caught something of the same. But I hope you are not an unfortunate man, rejoined I, for if you are, on your own principle, you shall ride no farther with me. "'Oh, no,' replied the other. "'My fortune is neither good nor bad. "'I am just in that indifferent state "'wherein a man is most liable to be affected "'by the fortune of the company he falls into.' "'Then, Lord, deliver you,' said I, "'for you have fallen in with one whose whole existence hitherto "'has been nothing but a tissue of mischances. "'And if I find, as I am afraid I shall, "'my aunt at Metz has died without making a will, "'my misfortunes will be complete.' "'for I shall have hardly bread to eat, "'without his eminence of Richelieu gives me a place, "'a recompense of a little service I once rendered him.' "'I tried hard to make this annunciation "'in as natural a tone as art could furnish me with, "'and I succeeded in evidently bewildering "'all the preconceived ideas of the spy, "'who, while I discharged my reckoning and mounted my horse, "'which was now ready, "'stood with his foot in the stirrup "'and his face full of incertitude,' not knowing whether to believe me or not. It luckily so happened that Achilles, who stood by, was totally ignorant of what motive induced me to quit Paris, and I might, for aught he knew, have had as many aunts at Metz as Danaeus had daughters, so that his countenance was not likely to contradict me. The spy, however, knowing that suspicion is the best rule of action for gentlemen of his cloth, under all circumstances, thought he could not do wrong in throwing his other leg over his horse's back and following me, even at the risk of my having an aunt really dying at Metz. 
accordingly he was instantly by our side keeping up with admirable perseverance the, the chattering inquisitive character he had assumed and never ceasing to ask one question or another till we arrived at san menoho where i again stopped for the night wherever we had occasion to pause even to water our horses i observed that my new companion was evidently known though every one affected to treat him as a stranger determined to get rid of him some way from this confirmation of the suspicions i entertained respecting the honourable capacity he filled as i was about to retire for the night i whispered to the host of san menejo sufficiently low to pass for a secret yet sufficiently loud to be heard to wake me at half-past four in the morning after this i proceeded to my room undressed myself went to bed and made achilles extinguish the light as if i were about to sleep soundly through the night but i took care to abstain from closing an eye though the temptation was very great to do so especially as i was entertained from the bed of my little companion with a sort of music which however unmelodious was very soporific i had previously ascertained that at one o'clock in the morning the king's ordinary courier was expected to pass from verdun and consequently that somebody would sit up in the inn to provide for his accommodation at midnight therefore i rose and waking achilles bade him dress himself and carry down the bags all of which we executed with the most marvellous silence paid the landlord who was sleeping by the fire saddled our own horses and very soon were far upon the road to verdun laughing over the surprise which our talkative companion would feel the next morning when he woke and found us irretrievably gone achilles thought it a very good joke and i a very happy deliverance and the dawn broke and found us congratulating ourselves still but what was my horror and surprise when turning my head in the grey light of the morning i saw the brown pourpoint and the funnel-shaped riding-boots and the strong little horse and the detestable little man not a hundred yards behind me cantering on as composedly as if nothing had occurred to separate him for a moment from my fortunate face as he called it ho ho cried he as he rode up i am not a man to force my society upon any one but i must say it was a very ungentlemanlike thing to get up in the night and leave me behind without so much as giving me warning or wishing me good evening and i have ridden all this way sir to tell you so we had already passed clermont en argonne and were in the heart of the wood that stretches round the village of dombay and is generally called the long wood of dombay i knew not what might be the consequence of suffering this old man to follow me to verdun but it was more than probable he would meet with many persons armed with sufficient authority either to detain us or to search our persons should he think fit to instigate such a proceeding but i was well aware that the life or death the safety or destruction of many of the first persons in the realm depended on my passing free and therefore i took my determination at once glancing up and down the road to see that all was clear i suddenly turned my horse upon him caught his bridle rein with one hand and his collar with the other and attempted to pull him off his horse but i soon found that i had to do with one who though weak in comparison with myself was nevertheless skilful in the management of his horse and the use of his arms in spite of my efforts he contrived to bring his horse's head round to shake off my grasp and drawing his sword to stand upon the defensive in so masterly a manner that the farther attack became a matter of no small difficulty i was now however too far committed to recede but while i considered the best means of mastering without injuring him he seemed to think i was daunted and cried out in a jeering tone ho ho your fortunate face is likely to get scratched if you come near me better ride on to see your aunt at metz or back to paris and persuade the cardinal to give you a place see that it be not in the bastille though ride in achilles on your side cried i while i ride in on mine quick we have no time to lose no sooner however did the old spy hear this order and see it likely to be executed than turning his horse back towards clermont he gave him full rein and spurred off at all speed this did not very well answer my purpose and dashing my spurs into my beast's side i made him spring on like a deer 
overtook the fugitive before he had gone twenty yards, and once more catching his collar, brought him fairly to the ground. It was no longer difficult to master his sword, and this being done, he begged most pitifully for mercy. "'Mercy you shall have,' replied I, "'but, by heaven, I will no longer be teased with such detestable persecution. "'Tis insupportable that a peaceable man cannot ride along the high road on his own affairs "'without having a chattering old dotard sticking to him like a horse-leech.' "'Achilles had by this time ridden up, and taking some strong cord which he happened to have with him, "'I pinioned the arms of my indefatigable pursuer.' and leading him a little way into the wood, I tied him tight to a tree, near a pile of faggots, which showed that the spot was so far frequented, that he would not be left many hours in such an unpleasant situation. My only object was to get rid of him, and this being effected, I again mounted my horse, and pursued my journey to Verdun, though, as I went, I could not help every now and then turning my head, and looking down the road, not a little apprehensive of seeing the brown pourpoint and funnel-shaped boots pursuing me once more. I arrived, however, unannoyed, and notwithstanding the prayers and entreaties of Achilles that I would but stay a quarter of an hour to satisfy the cravings of an empty stomach, I instantly hailed one of the flat boats that lie below the bridge. The little man, judging of my intention, spurred his horse as quick as light up to the traiteurs on the opposite side of the way, and before I had concluded a bargain with the boatman, to take us and our two horses to Sedan, he had returned with an immense roasted capon and half a yard of bread. Once in the boat, and drifting down the Meuse, I felt myself in safety, and a full current and favourable wind bore us rapidly to Sedan. It was night, however, before we arrived, and we found the gates closed and drawbridge raised, and all the most vigorous precautions taken to prevent the entrance of any unknown person into the town during the night if you will disembark sir said the boatman and go round to the land gate they will soon let you in for there are parties of fifty and sixty arriving every day and sedan will be too small to hold them before long however they refuse no one admittance for they say the count will soon take the field take the field said i and for what pray ah oh, that i don't know answered the boatman "'Folks say it is to dethrone the cardinal and make the king prime minister.' "'Whether this was a jest or a blunder, I did not well know. "'But bidding the man put me on shore, I led out my roan, "'and mounting on the bank rode round to a little hamlet "'which had gathered on each side of the road, "'at about a hundred yards from the Luxembourg gate. "'As I was going to inquire at one of the houses, "'I saw a sentinel thrown out as far as the foot of the glacis, and riding up to him, I asked if admission was to be procured that night. He replied in the affirmative, and proceeding to the gate, I was soon permitted to enter, but immediately my bridle was seized on each side by a pikeman, and the same being performed upon Achilles, we were led to a small guard-house, where we found a sleepy officer of the watch, who asked, with a true official drawl, "'Whom seek you in the good town of Sedan, and what is your business here?' "'I seek his highness, the Count de Soissons,' replied I, "'and my business with him is to speak on subjects that concern himself alone.' "'Your name and rank?' demanded the officer. "'Louis de Bigorre, Count de Lorme,' replied I, "'and this is my servant, Achilles Le Franc. "'We shall soon have need of Achilles,' said the officer, grinning. "'I wish, Monsieur le Comte, that you had brought a score or two such, "'though he seems but a little one.' Mouchard, guide these two gentlemen up to the castle. There is a pass. There is almost always something sad and gloomy in the aspect of a strange town at night. We seem in a dark, melancholy world, where every step is amongst unknown objects, all wrapped up in a cold, repulsive obscurity. And I felt like one of the spirits of the unburied, on the hopeless borders of Styx, as I walked on amidst the tall, dark houses of Sedan, which, as far as any interest that I had in them, were but so many ant-hills. Lighted by a torch that the soldier who guided us carried, and followed, as I soon perceived, by two other guards, we were conducted to the higher part of the town, where the citadel is situated, and there, after innumerable signs and countersigns, 
I was at last admitted within the walls, but not suffered to proceed a step in advance till such time as my name had been sent in to the principal officer on guard. I was thus detained half an hour, at the end of which time a page, splendidly dressed, appeared and conducted me to the interior of the building, with a display of reverence and politeness which augured well as to my father's reception. Achilles followed along the turnings and windings of the citadel, till we came to a chamber, through the open door of which a broad light streamed out upon the night, while a hundred gay voices chattered within, mingled with the ringing careless laugh of men who, cutting off from themselves the regrets of the past and the fears of the future, live wise and happy in the existence of the day. "'If you will do me the honour, sir,' said the page, turning to my little attendant, "'to walk into that room, you will find plenty of persons who will make you welcome to Sedan, while I conduct your master to another chamber.' Achilles bowed to the ground, and answered the page in a speech compounded suddenly from twenty or thirty tragedies and comedies, and though, to confess the truth, it hung together with much the same sort of uniformity as a beggar's coat, yet the attendant seemed not only satisfied, but astonished, and made me, as master of such a learned Theban, a lower reverence than ever, while he begged me to follow him. Meet it as one will, there is always a degree of anxiety attached to the first encounter with a person on whom our fate in any degree depends, and I caught my heart beating even as I walked forward towards the apartments of the Count de Soissons. We mounted a flight of steps, and at the top entered an antechamber where several inferior attendants were sitting, amusing themselves at various games. In the room beyond, too, the same sort of occupation seemed fully as much in vogue, for, of twenty gentlemen that it contained, only two were engaged in conversation, with some written papers between them, while all the rest were rolling the dice or dealing the cards, with most industrious application. Several, however, suffered their attention to be called off from the mighty interests of their game, and raising their heads gazed at me for a moment as I passed through the room, and then addressed themselves to their cards again with a laugh or an observation on the newcomer, which, with the irritable susceptibility of youth, I felt very well inclined to resent, if I could have found any specious plea for offence. The page still advanced, and throwing open a door on the other side of the room, led me through another small antechamber, only tenanted by a youth who was nodding over a book, to a door beyond, which he opened for me to pass, and left me to go in alone. The room which I entered was a large, lofty saloon, hung with rich tapestry, and furnished with antique chairs and tables, the dark hues of which, together with the sombre aspect of the carved oak plafond, gave a gloomy air of other days to the whole scene, so that I could have fancied myself carried back to the reign of Francis I. A large lamp, containing several lights, hung by a chain from the ceiling, and immediately under this, leaning back in a capacious, easy chair, sat a gentleman with a book in his hand, which he was reading, and evidently enjoying, for at the moment we entered he was laughing till the tears rolled over his cheeks. As soon as he heard a step, however, he laid down his book and turned towards the door, struggling to compose his countenance into some degree of gravity. As I advanced, he rose and addressed me with that frank and pleasing affability, which is the best and surest key to the human heart. "'Count Louis de Bigorre, I believe,' he said. "'You catch me in an occupation which the proverb attributes to fools, laughing at myself. But with such a companion as Sancho Panza, one may be excused.' though the same jest has made my eyes water a hundred times. However, be you most welcome, for you have been a long-expected guest at Sedan. Yet now you are arrived, he added. However great the pleasure may be to me, perhaps, it would have been better for yourself had you remained absent. I replied as a matter of course that I could not conceive anything better for myself than the honour of being attached to the Count de Soissons. Heaven only knows, said he, what may be the event to you or me but sit down and tell me why you left paris whom you saw there and what news was stirring in that great capital i have been four days on the road replied i bringing forward one of the smaller chairs so as to be sufficiently near the prince to permit the conversation to flow easily 
without approaching to any degree of familiar proximity. Perhaps, I continued, as I rode my own horses, I might not have had the honour of seeing your highness till to-morrow, had I not found it necessary to hurry forward to avoid a disagreeable companion. How so? demanded the Count. I hope no attempt was made to impede your progress hither, for if that has been the case, it is time that I shall look to my communications with my other friends in France. I gave the Count a somewhat detailed account of my adventures on the road, that he might judge what measures were necessary to ensure the secrecy of his correspondence with Paris. So, cried he, laughing, you have met with an old friend of ours here, Jean le Hableur, as he is called. He is one of the cardinal's most daring and indefatigable spies, and few are there who have had address and courage enough to baffle him as you have done. He traced my poor friend Armand de Paul to the very gates of Sedan, found out that he was carrying dispatches to me, filched a letter from his person containing much that should have remained secret, and having made himself acquainted with his name, laid such information against him that Armand, at his return to Paris, was instantly arrested and thrown into the Bastille. Why, the whole country between Verdun and Paris is so famous, or rather infamous, from his continual presence, that no one here dare pass by that road for fear of meeting with Jean le Hableur. You should have gone by Mezières. But where are these letters you speak of? I instantly produced them, and gave them into the hands of the Count, who read the letter from the Duke of Orléans, with a sort of smile that implied more scorn than pleasure. He then laid it down, saying aloud, with rather a bitter emphasis, My good cousin of Orléans! He then perused the epistle of Monsieur de Retz, and from time to time as he did so turned his eyes upon me, as if comparing the character which he therein found written down, and those ideas which he had already begun to form of me himself, from that outward semblance that almost always finds means to prejudice, even the widest and most cautious. When he had concluded, he rose and walked once or twice across the saloon, thoughtfully running his hand up and down the broad, rich sword-belt which hung across his breast, which I afterwards found was habitual with him when any consideration occupied him deeply. I had risen when he rose, but still stood near the table, without, however, turning my eyes towards it. For the letter of the Duke of Orléans lying open upon it, I did not choose to be suspected of even wishing to know its contents. "'Sit, sit, Count Louis,' said the Prince, resuming his seat, and then adding in a serious tone, but one of great kindness, "'Monsieur de Retz, I find, has not made you aware of all the circumstances of my present situation, and perhaps has done wisely to leave that communication to myself. From the great friendship and esteem, I may say affection, with which my mother regards you, I had not a moment's hesitation in saying that if you would join me here, you should have the very first vacant post in my household suitable to your own high rank and the antiquity of your family. Since then, the place of first gentleman of my bedchamber is void, I have reserved it for you. But as that is a situation which brings you so near my own person, an unlimited degree of confidence is necessary between us. Your rank, your family, the high name of your father and grandfather, the admirable character which my mother attributes to yours, all seem to vouch that you are, that you must be, everything noble and estimable, but still there are two or three circumstances which you must explain to me before I can feel justified in trusting you with that entire confidence I speak of. Monsieur de Retz says you have given him your history, which is a strange one, though how that can be I do not know, for you are but a young man and can have, I should imagine, but little to tell. He says farther that he met with you by accident, and seems to hint that, when he did so, you had not intended to join me here, as my mother informed me you would. He insinuates also that you were somewhat indiscreet towards him in speaking of your own affairs. Explain all this to me, for there is something evidently to be told. Make me your confidant without reserve, and in return I will confide to you secrets perhaps of greater importance. If you have nothing to tell but youthful errors or imprudence, speak without fear, as you would to a friend and brother. But, he added more gravely, if there is anything which affects your honour, which I may say I am sure there is not, I ask no confidence of the kind. 
"'Had your highness not required it,' replied I, "'I should not have presumed to intrude my private affairs upon your attention. "'But now that I find you, most justly, "'think it right to assure yourself of the character of one "'to whom you design the honour of being near your person, "'I may be permitted to express what happiness and consolation I feel "'in being allowed to repose all my griefs and misfortunes "'in the bosom of a prince universally beloved and esteemed.' "'When I spoke thus, I did not flatter.' and I concluded by giving as brief a sketch, but as accurate a one as possible, of all the events which filled the foregoing pages of these memoirs. "'I will own, my lord,' I added, "'that I told a part of this story to Monsieur de Retz, but only a small part, and that was in a moment of joy when, after having lived lonely and miserable in a large city for upwards of a month, I suddenly found that I was expected and would be welcomed by a prince possessed of a treasure which few princes i am afraid can boast a generous and a feeling heart i was perhaps indiscreet in communicating even a part to any one but your highness but you will not find that in your service i will be either indiscreet or unfaithful i believe you said the count on my honour i believe you and de retz was too hasty in even calling you indiscreet for your conduct towards our friend jean le Hableur, proves sufficiently that you can keep counsel your history has interested me more than i will tell you at present i feel for all you have suffered and i would not for the world barter that power of feeling for others against the most tranquil stoicism sympathy however though always agreeable to him that excites it is little pleasing to him who feels it without he can follow it up by some service to the person by whom it has been awakened i will try whether that cannot be the case with you but you are tired with your long journey and the night wears ho oh, without there send monsieur de varicarville hither we will talk more to-morrow monsieur de long since such is the name you choose i rose to depart but at the same time one of the gentlemen whom i had seen in the outer chamber conversing while the rest were gaming entered and the count introduced me to him begging him to show me all kindness and attention, as a person whom he himself esteemed and loved. End of chapter 36「Chapter 37 of De Lorme by G. P. R. James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 37 The manners of Monsieur de Varicaville were at once simple and elegant. There was none of the superfluous hyperbole of courts. There was little even of the common exaggeration of society in anything he said. He neither expressed himself ravished to make my acquaintance, nor delighted to see me. All he said was that he would do everything that depended upon him to make me comfortable during my stay at Sedan. And thus I always found him afterwards, neither what is in general called blunt which is more frequently rude nor what is usually called polite which is in general hollow he had too much kindness of heart ever to offend and too much sincerity ever to flatter but the goodness of his disposition and the native grace of his demeanour gave conjoined that real bienseance of which courtly politeness is but an unsubstantial shadow poor Varicaville i owe thee such a tribute best and most excellent of friends and though no epitaph hangs upon the tomb where thou sleepest in the hearts of all who knew thee thy memory is treasured and beloved after a few words of kindness and having received the note addressed to him from the abbe de retz he gave me into the hands of the count's maitre d'hotel telling him that i was the gentleman who had been so long expected and desiring him to see that i wanted nothing till such time as i was sufficiently familiarized with the place and its customs to take care of myself he then left me and i was conducted to a neat chamber with an ante-room containing three truckle beds for lackeys a small writing or dressing cabinet and several other conveniences which i had hardly expected in a castle so completely full as the citadel of sedan appeared to be before the maitre d'hotel left me i requested that my horses might be taken care of and that my servant might be sent to me hinting at the same time that if he brought me a cup of wine and something to eat 
I should not at all object, as I had tasted nothing all day except a wing of the capon, which Achilles had carried off from Verdun. My little attendant soon appeared, loaded with a great many more provisions than I needed, and congratulating both himself and me upon our sudden transportation from Paris, and the meagre diet we had there observed, to such a land of corn, wine, and oil. While I was undressing, some thoughts would fain have intruded, which I was very sure would have broken up my rest for the night. The agitation of being in new, strange scenes, acting with people of whom I yet knew hardly anything, and involved in schemes which at best were hazardous, was quite enough to make sleep difficult, and I felt very certain that if I let my mind rest one moment on the thought of Helen, and of the circumstances in which she might at that moment be placed, all hope of repose, mental repose at least, was gone, and where is any exercise so exhausting to the body as that anxious occupation of the mind? The next morning I was hardly awake when Monsieur de Varicaville entered my chamber, and informed me that Monsieur le Comte wished to see me, and dressing myself as fast as possible, I hurried to the prince's apartments, where I found him still in bed. Varicaville left us, and the Count made me sit down by his bedside. "'I have been thinking, de Lorme, said he, over the history you gave me last night, and I again assure you that I sympathise not a little with you. I am much older than you, and the first hasty torrent of passion has passed away at my time of life, but I can still feel and know that love such as you profess towards this young lady, whom your mother has educated, is not a passion easily to be rooted out, nor is the death of her brother by your hand an insurmountable obstacle. She evidently does not know it herself, and it would be a cruel piece of delicacy in you either to let her know it, or to sacrifice both her happiness and your own for such a scruple. The picture of Helen in the arms of her brother's murderer, and the horror she would feel at his every caress, if she did but know that he was so, rose up frightfully before my imagination, as the Count spoke, and without replying I covered my eyes with my hands, as if to shut the image out. "'This is an age, Monsieur de Lorme,' said the Count, "'in which few people would suffer, as you seem to do, for having shed their fellow-creature's blood, and yet I would not have you feel less. Feel, if you will, but still govern your feelings.' Every one in this world has much to suffer. The point of wisdom is to suffer well. But think over what I have said. Time may soon bring about a change in the face of affairs. If fortune smiles upon me, I shall soon have the power of doing greater things than obtaining letters of nobility for your fair lady's father. Thus the only substantial objection to your marriage will be removed. From what you said of the house where you last saw her, and the liveries of the servants, it must have been the hotel of the Maréchal de Châtillon, and the youth whose conversation you overheard was probably his nephew. But fear not for that. He is a hare-brained youth, little capable of winning the heart of a person such as you describe. The only thing that surprises me is that Arnaud, her father, should have acquired any degree of intimacy with so proud a man as Châtillon, but that very circumstance will be some excuse for asking nobility for him, and the favour will come with the more grace, as Châtillon is somewhat a personal enemy of my own. I thanked the prince for his kind intentions, though I saw no great likelihood of their fulfilment, and fancied that, like the cottager in the fairy tale, Monsieur le Comte imagined himself a great conqueror, and gave away crowns and sceptres, though he had not two roods of land himself but I was mistaken. The Count's expectations were much more likely to be accomplished than I had supposed, as I soon perceived when he began to explain to me his views and situation. When a man's mind is in doubt upon any subject, and he has heard reiterated a thousand times the various reasonings of his friends, without being able to choose his part determinately, it is wonderful with what eagerness he seeks for any new opinion to put him out of suspense the most painful situation in which the human mind can remain. Thus the Count de Soissons, after having entertained me shortly with my own affairs, entered full career upon his, and briefly touching upon the causes which originally compelled him to quit the court of France and retire to Sedan, he proceeded. 
here i would willingly have remained quiet and tranquil till the course of time brought some change i neither sought to return to a court where the king was no longer sovereign nor to cabal against the power of a minister upheld by the weakness of the monarch all i required was to be left at peace in this asylum where i could be free from the insult and degradation which had been offered me at the court of france i felt that i was sufficiently upholding the rights and privileges which had been transmitted to me by my ancestors and maintaining the general cause of the nobility of france by submitting to a voluntary exile rather than yield to the ambitious pretensions of a misproud minister and nothing would have induced me to raise the standard of civil war even though the king's own good was to be obtained thereby if richelieu had but been content to abstain from persecuting me in my retirement not the persuasion of the dukes of vendome and la valette nor the entreaties of my best friend the duke of Brion, nor the promises and seductions of the house of austria would have had any effect had i been left in peace but no never for a day has the cardinal ceased to use every measure in his power to drive me to revolt the truth is this he calculates upon the death of my cousin louis and upon seizing on the regency during the dauphin's minority he knows that there is no one who could and would oppose him but myself the duke of orleans is hated and despised throughout france the house of conde is bound to the cardinal by alliance he knows that he could not for a moment stand against me with the king's support and authority and he has resolved to ruin me while that support still lasts for this purpose he at one time offers me the, the command of one of the armies that i may return and fall into his power he at another threatens to treat me as a rebel and a traitor he now proposes to me a prince of the blood royal of france a marriage with his upstart niece and then menaces me with confiscation and attainder while at the same time my friends on every side press me to shake off what they call apathy to give my banner to the wind and marching upon paris to deliver the country the king and myself of this nightmare cardinal who sits a foul incubus upon the bosom of the state and troubles its repose with black and frightful dreams as he went on i could see that monsieur le comte worked himself up with his own words to no small pitch of wrath calling to mind one by one the insults and injuries that the cardinal had heaped upon him till all his slumbering anger woke up at once and with a flashing eye he added and so i will by heaven i will hurl him from his usurped seat and put an end to this tyranny which has lasted too long but very soon after relapsing again into his irresolution he asked what think you monsieur de l'orme should i not be justified am i not called upon so to do i will pray your highness replied i not to make me a judge in so difficult a point i am too young and inexperienced to offer an opinion where such great interests are concerned fie fie cried he with a smile you who have already acted the conspicuous part of member of the insurrectionary council at catalonia why we are all inexperienced in comparison with you tell me what had i better do if i must give an opinion monsieur i replied i think you had better endure as long as you can so as to leave no doubt in your own eyes in those of france in those of the world that you are compelled to draw the sword for the defence of your own honour and for the freedom of your country but once having drawn the sword cast away the scabbard then i am afraid the sword is half drawn already said the count there are eight thousand armed men in sedan fresh troops are pouring in upon me every day the news has gone abroad that i am about to take the field and volunteers are flocking from every quarter to my standard yesterday i had letters from at least sixty different parts of france assuring me that one battle gained but to confirm the fearful minds of the populace and that scarce a province will refrain from taking arms in my cause de retz is in hopes even of securing the bastille and he has already with that fine art which you have remarked in him bound to my cause thousands of those persons in the capital who in popular tumults guide and govern the multitude i mean the higher class of paupers 
the well-educated the well-dressed sometimes even the well-born who are paupers the more because they have more wants than the ostensible beggar these de Retz has found out in thousands has visited them in private relieved their wants soothed their pride familiarized himself with their habits and wishes and in short has raised up a party for me which almost ensures me the capital this last part of the count's speech instantly let me into the secret of monsieur de retz first visit to me my good landlady's tongue had probably not been idle concerning what she conceived my necessitous situation and upon the alert for all such cases of what monsieur le comte called higher pauperism de retz had lost no time in seeking to gain me as he had probably gained many others by a display of well-timed and discriminating charity god knows i was not a man to look upon wealth and splendour as a virtue in others nor to regard misfortune and poverty as a vice and yet with one of those contradictory weaknesses with which human nature swarms i felt inexpressibly hurt and mortified at having been taken for a beggar myself Monsieur le comte saw a sudden flush mount up into my cheek and judging from his own great and noble heart he mistook the cause i see what you think monsieur de l'orme said he you judge it mean to work with such tools but you are wrong in such an enterprise as this it is my duty to my country to use every means to employ all measures to ensure that great and decisive preponderance which will bring about success without any long protracted and sanguinary struggle i assured him that i agreed with him perfectly and that i entertained no such thoughts as he suspected so far from it replied i that if your highness will point out to me any service i can render you be it of the same kind you have just mentioned or not you will find me ready to obey you therein with as much zeal as monsieur de retz there is a candour about you my good de l'orme replied the count which i could not doubt for a moment even if i would but what would all my sage counsellors say the suspicious bouillon the obdurate bardouville if i were to entrust missions of such importance to one of whom i know so little one who they might say was only instigated to seek me by a temporary neglect of richelieu and who would easily be led to join the other party by favour and preferment i am not one to commit such treachery my lord replied i hastily i am ready to swear before god upon his holy altar neither to abandon nor betray your highness nay nay said the count de soissons smiling at my heat swear not my dear count unhappily in our days the atmosphere which surrounds that holy altar you speak of is so thick with perjuries that an honest man can hardly breathe therein i doubt you not de l'orme your word is as good to me as if you swore a thousand oaths and i am much inclined to give you a commission of some importance both because i know i can rely upon your wit and your honour and because your person is not so well known in paris as the other gentlemen in my household but to return to what we were saying still give me your opinion about drawing the sword as you have termed it ought i or ought i not by my faith your highness replied i i think it is drawn already as you yourself have admitted not so decidedly answered the count but that it can be sheathed again and if this cardinal alarmed at these preparations as i know he is will but yield such terms of compromise as may ensure my own safety and that of my companions permit the thousands of exiles who are longing for their native country to return and secure the freedom and the peace of france far far be it from me ever to shed one drop of gallic blood but does not your highness still continue your preparations then demanded i most assuredly replied the count the matter must come to a conclusion speedily either by a negotiation and treaty which will ensure us our demands or by force of arms and therefore it is well to be prepared for the latter though most willing to embrace the former alternative and does the minister seem inclined to treat asked i he always pretends that he is so replied monsieur de soissons but who can judge of what his inclinations are by what he says his whole life is a vizard as hollow as false as unlike the real face of the man 
we all know how negotiations can be protracted and he has used every means to keep this in suspense till he could free himself from other embarrassments he asked our demands and then misunderstood them and then required a fuller interpretation of particular parts and then mistook the explanation then let a month or two slip by and then again required to know our demands as if he had never heard them and then began over again the same endless train of irritating delay but however there is one of our demands which we will never relinquish and which he will never grant except he be compelled which is the solemn condemnation and relinquishment of all special commissions i am not very well aware of the meaning of that term said i may i crave your highness to explain it to me i do not wonder at your not knowing it answered the count it is an iniquity of his own invention totally unknown to the laws of france when any one was accused of a crime formerly the established authorities of the part of the country in which it was averred to have been committed took cognizance of the matter and the accused was tried before the usual judges but now on the contrary on any such accusation this cardinal issues his special commission to various judges named by himself uniformly his most devoted creatures and often the personal enemies of the accused under such an abuse who can escape false accusers can always be procured and where the judges are baser still justice is out of the question the whole of france is no longer administered but the personal resentments of richelieu the conversation continued for some time in the same course and turned but little to the advantage of the minister the count de soissons had real and serious cause of indignation against richelieu on his own account and this made him see all the public crimes of that great but cruel and vindictive minister in the most unfavourable light the stimulus of neglect had in my mind also excited feelings which made me lend an attentive ear to the grievances and wrongs that the prince was not slow in urging and my blood rose warmly against the tyranny which had driven so many of the great and noble from their country and spilt the most generous blood in france upon the scaffold i have through life seen self-interest and private pique bias the judgment of the wisest and the best intentioned and i never yet in all the wide world met with a man who in judging of circumstances wherein he himself was in any way involved did not suffer himself to be prejudiced by one personal feeling or another the most despotic lords of their own passions have always some favourite that governs them themselves far be it from me then to say i was not very willing and easy to be convinced that the man who had neglected me had also abused his power tyrannised over his fellow-subjects and wronged both his king and his country i was in the heat of youth soon prepossessed and already prejudiced and whatever i might think afterwards i at the moment looked upon the enterprise which was contemplated by monsieur le comte as one of the most noble and justifiable that had ever been undertaken to free one's native country from a tyrant there was also in the manners of the count de soissons that inexpressible charm which leaves the judgment hardly free it is impossible to say exactly in what it consisted i have seen many men with the same princely air and demeanour and with the same suavity of manner who did not in the least possess that sort of fascination which like the cestus of the goddess won all hearts for him that was endowed with it i was not the only one that felt the charm everybody that surrounded the prince everybody that in any degree came in contact with him were all affected alike towards him even the common multitude experienced the same and the shouts with which the populace of paris greeted his appearance on some day of ceremony are said to have been the first cause of the cardinal's jealous persecution of him one saw a fine and noble spirit a generous and feeling heart shining through manners that were at once dignified while they were affable and warm though polished and it might be the conviction of his internal rectitude and his perfect sincerity which added the master spell to a demeanour eminently graceful whatever it was the fascination on my mind was complete and i hardly know what i would have refused to undertake in the service of such a prince 
at the end of our conversation scarcely knowing that i did so i could not help comparing in my own mind my present interview with the count de soissons with that which i had formerly had with the cardinal de richelieu and how strange was the difference of my feelings at the end of each i left the minister cold dissatisfied dispirited and i quitted the count de soissons with every hope and every wish ardent in his favour with all my best feelings devoted to his service and my own expectations of the future raised and expanded by my communion with him like a flower blown fully out of the influence of a genial day of summer on leaving the count's apartments i passed through a room in which i found m de vary cabille with several other gentlemen to whom he introduced me and we then proceeded to the grand hall of the chateau where we were met by the personal suite of the duke of bouillon who divided the interior of the citadel equally with his princely guest the duke had this morning made some twinges of the gout an excuse for taking his breakfast with the duchess in his own apartment and the counts did so habitually but for the rest of the party two long tables were spread each containing fifty covers which were not long in finding employers the table soon groaned with the breakfast and every one drew his knife and fell to with the more speed as it had been announced that the tilt yard of the castle would be open at eight of the clock to such as chose to run at the ring after which there would be a course de tete neither of these exercises i had ever seen and consequently was not a little eager for the conclusion of the meal although i could but hope to be a spectator End of chapter 37chapter thirty eight of de lorme by g p r james this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirty eight immediately after breakfast i returned to the apartments of the count de soissons to attend him with the rest of his suite to the tilt-yard and in a few minutes after was called to his chamber by his valet i found him already dressed and prepared to take his share in the sports he was fitting himself with a right-hand glove of strong buff leather which covered his arm to the elbow and in regard to the exact proportions of which he seemed as curious as a young lordling of a new pourpoint what de lorme cried he not gloved you can never hold your lance without such a supplementary skin as this choose one from this heap and see that the flap fall clear over the inner part of your forearm i endeavoured to excuse myself by informing his highness that i was quite unused to such exercises but he would not hear of my being merely a spectator and replied laughing nonsense nonsense i must see how you ride and how you use your sword to know whether i can give you a regiment of cavalry with safety ho oh, gouvion order monsieur de lorme's horse to be saddled instantly there was of course no way of opposing the count's command and though i was very much afraid that i should do myself no great credit i was obliged to submit and accompanied monsieur le comte to the little court at the foot of the staircase with somewhat nervous feeling at the idea of exhibiting myself before two or three hundred people in exercises which i had never even seen i had quite sufficient vanity to be timid where failure implied the slightest touch of ridicule the tilt-yard consisted of a large piece of level ground within the walls of perhaps a couple of acres in extent the centre of which was enclosed with barriers surrounding an oblong space of about two hundred feet in length by fifty in breadth the distance was so small from the court before the count's apartments to the barriers that he had sent on the horses and walked thither followed by myself and about a dozen other gentlemen of his suite as we approached the people who had assembled to witness the exercises and amongst whom were a number of soldiers received the count with a shout sufficiently indicative of his popularity and separating respectfully as he advanced permitted him to meet a small knot of the more distinguished exiles who had flocked to his standard at the first report of his having determined to take arms against the cardinal the count proceeded onward bowing to the people in recognition of their welcome with that bland smile which sits so gracefully on the lips of the great and then advancing with somewhat of a quicker step as he perceived the group of nobles i have mentioned hurrying to meet him he spoke to them all 
but selected two for more particular attention. The first was a man of about fifty, and after I had heard him named as the Duke of Vendôme, I fancied I could discover in his face a strong likeness to the busts of Henri IV. The second was the Duke of Bouillon, and certainly never did I behold a countenance which, without being at all handsome, possessed so pre-eminently intellectual an expression. To me it was not pleasing, nor was it was what is called shrewd, nay, nor thoughtful, and yet it was all mind, mind quick to perceive, and strong to repel, and steady to retain, and bold to uphold. The whole was more impressive than agreeable, and gave the idea of all the impulses springing from the brain, and none arising in the heart. After he had returned the embrace of the Count de Soissons, his quick dark eye instantly glanced to me with an inquiring look. The prince saw, and interpreted his glance, and making me a sign to advance, he introduced me to his ally as Louis Count de Lorme, only son of the noble house of Bigor, the first gentleman of his bedchamber. The duke bowed low, and, with what I judged rather an unnecessary ostentation of politeness, welcomed me to Sedan, while the Count, with a smile that seemed to imply that he read clearly what was passing in his friend's mind, said in a low tone, "'Do not be afraid, Bouillon. If he is not for you, he is not against you.' "'He that is not for me,' replied the Duke of Bouillon, with that irreverent use of scriptural expressions which was so common in those days, he that is not for me is against me. I love not neutrals. Give me the man who has spirit enough to take some determinate side and support it with his whole soul. All the blood in my body, I believe, found its way up into my cheek, but I remained silent, and the Count, seeing that Monsieur de Bouillon was in an irritable mood, and judging that I was not of a disposition patiently to bear many such taunts as he had most undeservedly launched at me, led the way to the barriers. Monsieur de Riquemont, the Count's chief écuyer, having been appointed maître de camp for the time, opened the barriers and entered the field first, followed by a crowd of valets and estafiers, carrying in a number of lances and pasteboard blocks, made to represent the heads of Moors and Saracens, which were deposited in the middle of the field. The prince then mounted his horse, and followed by the dukes of Bouillon, Vendôme, and La Valette, rode through the barrier, turning to me as he did so, and calling me to keep near him. I instantly sprang upon my horse, which little Achilles held ready for me, and galloped after the count. All those whose rank entitled them to pass did the same. A certain number of grooms and lackeys were also admitted, to hold the horses, amongst whom Achilles contrived to place himself, and the barriers being closed, the rest of the people ranged themselves without, which was, indeed, the best situation for viewing the exercises. At about two-thirds of the course from the entrance, raised above one of the posts which upheld the wooden railing of the enclosure, was a high pillar of wood, with a crossbar at the top, in form of a gallows, and which was, in fact, called La Potence. From this was suspended a ring, hanging about a foot below the beam, and during the course one of the prince's domestics was mounted on the barrier, supporting himself by the pillar of wood, to ascertain precisely whether those who missed hitting the inside of the ring, and so carrying it away, might not touch its edge, which was counted as an inferior point. The Mestre de Camp now arranged us in the order in which we were to run, and I was glad to find that I should be preceded by five cavaliers, from each of whom I hoped to receive a lesson. The prince, of course, took the lead, and I observed that a great deal of dexterity was necessary to couch the lance with grace and ease. After pausing for a moment with the lance erect, he made a demi volte and gradually dropping the point, brought his elbow slowly to his side, while putting his horse into a canter, and then into a gallop. He kept the point of the weapon steadily above the right ear of his horse, exactly on a line with his own forehead, till coming near the pillar with his charger at full speed, he struck the ring and bore it away. The marker now cried loudly, Un de don, un de don, and some of the estafiers ran to place another ring. In the meanwhile, amidst the applauses which multitudes always so unscrupulously bestow upon success, 
the count without looking behind rode round the field slowly raising the point of his lance on which he still bore the ring he had carried away the duke of bouillon notwithstanding his gout proceeded next to the course and without taking any great pains respecting the grace of his movements aimed his lance steadily and carried away the ring the duke of vendome had declined running and m de la valette though managing his horse and his lance with the most exquisite grace passed the ring without hitting it at all de varicaville missed the centre but struck it on the outside when the marker cried loudly une attente l'inattente and the marquis de bardouville who like a great many other very hard-headed men was famous for such exercises spurred on and carried it away like lightning it now became my turn and i will own that i wished myself anywhere in the wide world but there however there was no remedy and i was sure that though i might not be able to carry away or even touch the ring i could manage my horse as well as any man in the field but i had forgotten that to every such compact as that between a man and his horse there are two parties both of whom must be in perfect good humour the roan horse which had borne me from paris was an excellent strong roadster and sufficiently well broke for all common purposes but for such exercises as those in which both he and his master were so unwillingly engaged he had no taste whatever it was with the greatest difficulty therefore that i compelled him to make his demi volte before beginning the course this accomplished he galloped on steadily enough towards the pillar but just at the moment that i was aiming my lance to the best of my power the potence the ring and the man standing on the railing all seemed to catch his sight at once and thinking it something very extraordinary and not at all pleasant he started sideways from the course and dashed into the very centre of the field scattering the estaffier and valet like a flock of sheep and treading upon the pasteboard heads of moors and turks with most pitiless precipitation spurs and bridle were all in vain i might as well have spurred a church steeple and in the end down he came upon his haunches in the most ungraceful posture in the world while a loud shout of laughter from the duke of bouillon and several others announced that my misfortune had not afforded the smallest part of the morning's amusement god forgive me i certainly could have committed more than one murder in the height of my wrath and digging my spurs into my horse's sides with most unjustifiable passion till the blood streamed from them i forced him up and rode round to the spot where the duke of bouillon stood with intentions which i had luckily time to moderate before i arrived i passed on therefore to the count de soissons merely giving the duke a glance as i passed in which he might well read what was passing in my heart he returned it with a cold stare and then turned to bardouville with a sneering smile which had nearly driven me mad your highness sees said i as i came near the count the unfortunate issue of my attempt to give you pleasure perhaps you will now condescend to excuse my father exposing myself to the laughter of m de bouillon and his friends fie you are angry my dear de Lorme, replied the count with a degree of good humour i hardly deserved i will certainly not excuse you going on with the exercises you managed that horse as well as such a horse could possibly be managed and a great deal better than any of the laughers would have done but though a good strong beast he is not fit for such games as these and therefore as soon as i saw him start i sent one of my grooms for a managed horse of my own that has a mouth like velvet and will obey the least touch of the leg mount my good de Lorme, and shame these merry fools by showing them some better horsemanship than they can practise themselves the count then turning to the rest kindly amused a few moments in conversation till such time as he saw his groom trotting down the beautiful charger he proposed to lend me i made a sign to achilles to hold the horse i was upon and alighting the moment the other passed the barrier i laid my hand lightly on his shoulder and sprang into the saddle without touching the stirrup the courses recommenced and m le comte again carried away the ring not so the duke of bouillon who merely touched it on the outer edge the duc de la valette also gained an attente and both varicaville and bardouville carried it away as may be supposed i had watched narrowly every motion of the other cavaliers 
and had remarked and endeavoured to appropriate all that sat gracefully upon them habituated from my infancy to almost every other corporeal exercise and game i found no great difficulty in acquiring this and mounted as i was upon a horse that seemed almost instinctively to know its rider's will and obey it i had every advantage the noble animal performed his demi volte with the utmost grace and precision and now finding by the very touch of the bridle that i had a different creature to deal with i easily balanced the lance as i had seen the count de soissons kept the point over my horse's right ear and somewhat imitating the swiftness with which de bardouville had run his course i galloped on at full speed struck the ring right in the centre and bore it away at once the feelings of a multitude unlike the feelings of most individuals do not seem mixed and blended with each other but each appears separate and distinct reigns its moment and then gives way to another like the passions of an ardent and hasty man and this probably because the sensations of all the parts of the crowd act in the aggregate while any counteracting principle is confined to one or two and does not appear thus the spectators outside the barriers who had laughed with the duke of bouillon at my former failure were as ready to triumph with me as over me and greeted my success with a loud shout while suddenly bringing my horse into a walk i proceeded round the field slowly raising my lance with the ring still upon the point the count de soissons fixed his eyes upon me and gave me a glance expressive of as much pleasure as if he had been the person interested while the duke of bouillon looked on with an air of the most perfect indifference and talked aloud with bardouville upon the pleasures of a barbecued pig mixed feelings of indignation and triumph excited me to a pitch of exertion which brought with it greater success than i could have expected i again carried away the ring and at the end of the third course found myself only exceeded in the number of points i had made by the count de soissons who had carried the ring twice and struck it once the different pasteboard heads were now placed in the positions assigned for them and the count de soissons who generously entered into all my feelings and saw that anger had made success a matter of importance to me now beckoning me to him bade me in a whisper to remark well the manoeuvres of those who preceded me and above all things to take care that i neither dropped my hat nor withdrew my foot from the stirrup as though merely a matter of etiquette the course was considered lost by such an occurrence i thanked his highness for his caution and fixing my hat more firmly on my head and myself more steadily in the saddle i left him to run his course the heads had been placed at various distances along the line of the barriers one a most ferocious-looking saracen was fixed upon an iron stand at about one hundred and twenty-five feet from the beginning of the course and raised about eight feet from the ground this was made to turn upon a pivot and near it in the exact centre of the course was placed a target painted with a head of medusa as soon as all was arranged the count couched his lance and ran full speed at the saracen but not being hit exactly in the centre the head turned upon its pivot and the lance passed off the prince however rode on and tossing the lance to an estaffier who stood ready to catch it turned with a demi volt at the corner and drawing one of his pistols from the saddle-bow galloped towards the medusa in the centre of the barrier the crowd on the outside now ran in every direction and the count discharging his pistol hit the face upon the target exactly in the middle of the brow without pausing he urged his horse forward and making the same turn nearly where i stood he came back upon the head and fired his second pistol at it with the same success he then made a complete vault during which he replaced his pistol drew his sword and galloping past the third head which was placed upon a little mound of earth about two feet high near the opposite barrier he gave point with his sword in tierce struck it on the forehead and raising his hand in cart held up the head upon the sword's point i found that the groom who had brought down the count's horse for me had taken care to provide pistols also and as the principal feats in this course were performed with weapons which i was accustomed to i did not fear the result the gentleman who preceded me met with various success 
but Barduville, who was certainly the most stupid of them all in mind, was the most expert in body, and carried every point. I followed his example, and succeeded in bearing off the Saracen's head upon the point of my lance, making both my shots tell upon the head of Medusa, and bringing up the third head upon the point of my sword. Accidental, or not accidental, my success changed the posture of affairs, for the Duke of Bouillon from that moment seemed to regard me in a very different light from that which he had done at first and as we rode out of the barriers he kept the prince in close conversation which from the glancing of his eye every now and then towards me i could not doubt had some reference to myself End of chapter thirty eight chapter thirty nine of delorme by g p r james this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirty nine on our arrival at the citadel the two princes separated and monsieur le comte retired to his own apartments whither i followed him in company with the principal officers of his household as he passed on into his own saloon he made me a sign to enter also and while a valet pulled off his boots congratulated me upon my success in the tilt yard nor must you be discontented de lorme continued he because there was some little pain mingled with the first of your feats it rendered your after triumph the greater certainly monsieur replied i i would rather it had not happened but yet of course i do not look upon it as any very serious misfortune and yet said he with a smile you looked at the time as if you felt it one we are apt my dear count to fancy in our youth that the sweet cup of life has not a drop of bitter but we all soon discover that it is not so with life as with everything else we find the bright and delightful scattered thinly amidst the immensity of baser matter those who seek pearls are obliged to plunge into the deep briny sea to drag them up and even then perchance out of every shell ten will be worthless but did we find pearls hanging amongst grapes or diamonds at the roots of roses we should value neither one nor the other as they merit as it is the threads of pain are woven so intimately in the web of life that they form but one piece, and wise was the hand that ordered it so. The Count being by this time disembarrassed of his boots, he dismissed the lackey, and then proceeded, Now that we are alone, said he, I will give up my homily, for I have other matters to consult you upon. This morning you said, in speaking of de Retz, that you would willingly undertake and execute for me any commission similar to that which he so dexterously exercises are you still so inclined mark me de lorme he added suddenly you are bound by nothing that you said this morning men of a quick and ardent temperament like yours are often led from one step to another in the heat of conversation till they promise and feel willing to perform at the time many things that upon mature consideration they would be very sorry to undertake their feelings go on like waves of the sea each hurrying forward the one before it till the ripple becomes a billow that dashes over every obstacle in its way then comes consideration like the ebb of the tide and their wishes flow gradually back far from the point at which they had arrived at first should this be your case you are free to retract and i tell you beforehand that the service upon which i will put you is one of difficulty and also of some personal danger to yourself i replied by assuring the count that what i had said in my former conversation with him unlike most conversations on earth contained nothing that i could wish unsaid that my offer to serve him had originated in personal attachment and that of course that attachment had much increased instead of diminishing by all that had passed during the morning danger and difficulty i father said were hardly to be looked upon as objections when by encountering them we could prove our sincerity and therefore that he had nothing to do but point out the course he wished me to follow and he might feel assured i would do so to the best of my abilities be it so then replied the count and i entertain no doubt of either your discretion or success before your arrival i had entrusted to m de retz all that a man of his profession could do for me in the capital but still there is much more to be done he has undertaken to win one part of society to our cause 
but you must know that in paris there is a complete class of men distinct and separate from all the rest of the people whom it concerns me much to gain for the purpose of securing the metropolis you will be curious to know what class i speak of i mean he added with a smile the honourable body of bravos swashbucklers swindlers and in short the whole company of those who having no property of their own live at the expense of others i am credibly informed that these persons form one great body and have certain means of corresponding and communicating with each other throughout the kingdom the number in paris is said to be twenty thousand you may well look surprised but it is an undoubted fact and it is to gain these respectable allies that i now intend to send you back to the capital the mission truly is not a very elevated one but when i do not disdain to treat with such a body you must not scorn to be my ambassador in the conduct of this business you and de retz must be in constant correspondence for though his clerical character stands in the way of his taking any active part in the negotiation itself his knowledge of paris and all that it contains may be of the greatest service to you in facilitating your communication with these gentry who are not in general very fond of trusting their secrets with strangers the prince was then proceeding once more to give the motives which induced him to look upon nothing as mean which could ensure the most speedy termination to an enterprise on which the fate of france depended reasoning with all the eloquence of a man who not very sure of being in the right hopes to persuade himself thereof while he is persuading another but i assured him in reply that i was perfectly convinced of the propriety of the conduct which he pursued and only required to be made perfectly aware of the nature of my mission what i was to demand and what i might promise on his part much must be left to your own discretion replied the count the object is to ensure that these men will instantly rise in my favour on a given signal but not to commit me to them so far that i cannot retract should any change of circumstances induce me to abandon the enterprise the sketch of monsieur le comte as drawn by the marquis de saint brie instantly rose to my recollection at these words and i saw how truly he had spoken when he had said that want of resolution was the great defect of the count's character how dangerous such irresolution must ever be in the conduct of great undertakings was at once evident and i almost shuddered to think what might be the possible consequences to all concerned if the struggle that was likely to ensue could not be terminated at a blow this more than any other consideration made me resolve to exert the utmost energies of my mind in the part that was allotted to me for the purpose of preparing everything to act upon the same point at the same moment and produce one great and overpowering effect i promised therefore to do my best according to the views his highness entertained and said that i doubted not of my success with the persons to whom i was sent provided i was furnished with the necessary means to touch their hearts through the only points in which the hearts of such men are vulnerable you shall have it de l'orme you shall have it replied the count though money is one of those things of which we stand most in need but you will not set out till to-morrow morning and before that time i will try to furnish you with a few thousand crowns for i know it is absolutely necessary especially as i trust you will on your return bring with you two or three hundred recruits for should you find any of our friends the swashbucklers who have a grain or two more honesty than the rest you must enlist them in our good cause and send them one by one over to mouzon but now hire you to the rest till dinner and accept as the first earnest of my friendship the good horse on whose back you were so successful just now no thanks no thanks my good de l'orme take him as he stands and he may perhaps recall me to your memory when louis de bourbon is no more there was a touch of sadness in the count's tone that found its way to the heart and like the whole of his manners won upon the affection it seemed to familiarize one with the inmost feelings and any coldness in his cause would have been like a breach of confidence a prince binds himself to his inferior by making him the sharer of his pleasures or his follies but he binds his inferior to him by admitting him into the solemn tabernacle of his heart on retiring from the prince's apartments i felt no inclination to join any of the merry 
thoughtless parties of his friends that were roving about the town and the citadel some running to the mall some to the tennis court and all eager to chase away those precious hours which man the prodigal squanders so thoughtlessly in his youth to covet with so much avarice in his latter days on the stairs however that conducted to my own apartments i met monsieur de varicaville who gave me the good morning and stopped to speak with me i know not monsieur de lorme said he whether i am about to take a liberty with you but i have just seen your servant conducted to the private cabinet of the duke of bouillon it appeared to me this morning that you were not inclined to attach yourself to the duke's party and that from that or some other cause he seemed somewhat ill-disposed towards you at first i therefore presume to tell you of your servants having gone to him that if you did not yourself send him you may make what inquiries you think fit you are still young in the intrigues of this place or i should not give you this warning this took place not above ten steps from my own chamber and after thanking barry caville for his information i asked him to wait with me for achilles's return and we would question him together concerning his absence this mark of confidence on my part opened the way for the same on the part of the marquis and after proceeding cautiously step by step for a few minutes both fearful that we might betray in some degree the trust reposed in us by m le comte if we spoke openly and neither wishing to intrude himself into the private opinions of the other we gradually found that there was nothing to be concealed on either side and that our opinions tended immediately towards the same point this once established and the communication instantly became easy between us varicaville spoke his sentiments freely concerning the situation and character of the count and the schemes and wishes of the duke of bouillon whose endeavours to hurry the prince into a civil war were every day becoming more active and more successful notwithstanding the advantages which may accrue to himself said varicaville and which are certainly very many i do believe that the duke seeks principally the good and honour of m le comte and did i feel sure that the event we desire could be procured by a single battle or even a single campaign i should not oppose him for an excellent soldier and even a skilful general the count would be almost certain to overcome the only disposable force which the cardinal could oppose to him this however would not be the only arms with which the wily minister would fight him he would employ negotiations treaties and intrigues and thus he would conquer and even intimidate a man who has really ten times more personal courage than those who most eagerly urge him to war from what you have said i easily see that you have discovered the prince's defect he has no resolution he has the courage of a lion but still he has no resolution the first to use the words of the abbe de retz is an ordinary and even a vulgar quality the second is rare even in great men but yet there are two situations in which it is eminently necessary the ministry of a great country and the chief of a conspiracy richelieu has it in the most eminent degree and the man who would oppose him with success must not therein be deficient while he spoke the door of the chamber opening achilles made his appearance and was running up to me when he perceived m de varicaville and suddenly stopped what were you going to say achilles demanded i you may speak freely this is a friend but what i have to say is a state secret which i shall communicate to none but your lordship replied the little player with a look of vast importance deep in the bottom of my profound heart will i hide it till opportunity shall unlock the door and draw it forth from its dungeon varicaville looked somewhat surprised but i who better understood my attendant's fame merely replied you had better draw it forth immediately yourself my good achilles for fear i should break the dungeon door as you call it and your head both in one oh if your lordship insists replied the little player not displeased at the bottom of his heart to be delivered of his secret at once i have nothing for it but to obey know then illustrious scion of a noble house that as i was returning from that famous field wherein you this morning covered yourself with victory one of the domestic servants of the great and puissant prince frederic maurice duke of bouillon and sovereign of sedan 
pulled me by the tags of my doublet and insinuated in a low and solemn voice that his master wanted to speak with me to which i replied that duty is the call which generous souls obey and therefore that i must see whether you stood in need of anything before i could follow him finding however that you were closeted with monsieur le comte i proceeded to the lodging of the high and puissant prince who asked me if i were much in your private secrets to this i answered that i did not believe there was a thought on earth which you concealed from me you were either a great fool or a great knave to say so replied i and i do not very well know which a knave a knave please your worship replied achilles with a low bow a fool has something degrading in it i would rather at any time be supposed to exercise the profession of hermes than that of Esculapius. but listen he next asked me how long i had been in your worship's service of which i replied all my life that we had been brought up together from the cradle my mother i assured him was your worship's wet nurse so that we were foster brothers a pretty apocrypha truly replied i but go on his highness then asked me proceeded achilles whether your lordship leaned really to peace or war to which i replied that as yet i believed you were quite undecided although your natural disposition led you to war for which you had so strong a turn that you must needs go fighting in catalonia when you had no occasion in life at this i thought he looked pleased but i was afraid of going any farther for fear of committing your excellence so then his majesty proceeded to say that i must try to determine you to go to war and that you must try and determine monsieur le comte and on the back of this he gave me at least one hundred excellent reasons why men should cut one another's throats all of which i have forgot but doubtless your eminence can imagine them and then gave me a purse not at all as a bribe he said but merely for the trouble he had given me and made me promise at the same time not to reveal one word of what had passed to any one which i vowed upon my honour and my reputation and came away to tell your grace as fast as possible and your honour and your reputation mon drol said varicarville what has become of them oh your worship replied achilles i stretched them so often in my youth that they cracked long ago and then instead of patching them up as many people do which is but a sorry contrivance and not at all safe i threw them away altogether and have done ever since quite as well without after having sent achilles away i consulted with varicarville in regard to the proper course of proceeding under such circumstances all you can do replied he is to take no notice and remain firm if i understand you rightly that you are determined to join with those who would dissuade the count from proceeding to so dangerous an experiment as war i am certainly so far determined replied i that i will continue to oppose such a proceeding till i see the count once resolved upon it but after that i will so far from endeavouring to shake his resolution do all in my power to keep him steady in it and to promote the success of the enterprise for i am convinced that after that hesitation and conflicting opinions in the party of the prince might bring about his ruin but could do no good perhaps you are right replied varicarville and that is all that i could hope or require when i see you alone with the count i shall now feel at ease convinced that as long as he continues undecided you will continue to oppose any act of hostility to the government and when he is decided and the die cast we must both do our best to make the issue successful thus ended my conference with varicarville and nothing farther occurred during the day affecting myself personally i heard of the arrival of several fresh parties both from the interior of france and from the adjacent countries which were almost peopled with french exiles and achilles also brought me news that the baron de beauvau had returned from the low countries accompanied by a spanish nobleman as plenipotentiary from the archduke leopold and the cardinal Infant of spain but nothing of any consequence happened till the evening in which i was at all called to take part i strolled however through the town of sedan and from the labours which were hurrying forward at various points of the fortifications i was led to conclude that the duke of bouillon himself anticipated but a short interval of peace 
At length, as I approached an unfinished hornwork on the banks of the Meuse, a sentinel dropped his partisan to my breast, bidding me stand back, and my walk being interrupted in that direction, I returned to the citadel and proceeded to my own chamber. End of chapter 39